we're doing all right on time. I was telling Holly I was worried I was going to have to really speed through this thing and, and not be able to make a lot of examples and illustrations because of time. But uh, Psalms chapter 18 with me, if you would. This will be our final sermon out of chapter 18. Amen. Uh, last week, or not last week, two weeks ago. Sorry, I, I forget my days. Uh, but last week was the, or not, no, it was last week. Whew, okay, I'm good. Two weeks ago was a prayer service. Last week we covered Paul giving credit where credit was due. Now, at this point, when Paul wrote Psalms chapter 18, it could have easily been a, a psalm where he thanks God and then said, man, I'm the king, people love me, I'm this, I'm that, I've had victory, I'm all this in a bag of potato chips because, well, I'm awesome. But he didn't take an ounce of credit for anything. He didn't even take a credit for his own uh, athleticism from birth, his own God-given strength. He says it was all God, and we even call it God-given strength because it was all God. And uh, we ended off on verse 43, and then as I continued to study, I realized verses 44 and 45 really went with last week better than it went with this week. And so um, I'm going to read those, and then I might even say a few words while we're reading it. But our, our text is actually the final verses from verses 46 to 50 of Psalms chapter 18, a psalm designated uh, that David, David wrote to basically say, Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for delivering me out of the hand of Saul and my enemies. Uh, thank you. You've been so good to me. It ends with a very good note. So let's stand together in honor of God's word. And like I said, I'll begin reading in verse number 44. And if you were here last week, you'll understand why I say it fits better with last week. In fact, you can even go back and listen to last week's sermon on our YouTube page if you feel like it. It says, As soon as they hear of, of me... They shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. I again believe this is not just referencing David's kingdom currently, but David's kingdom in the future to come. And I think he was referencing even the millennial kingdom. And so not so much because as far as I could understand it, as we talked about last week, he never had other nations under his control necessarily. Now other nations might have been subsequently under his control just because how powerful they were. Uh, verse 45, the strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their closed places. Now here's our, here's really where we're going to focus tonight. Verse 46, the Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Anybody ever heard the song from that? I struggle to even say it without singing the song. I'm going to sing it anyway. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. In fact, I was trying to teach that to my kids the last couple nights in our family devotion times. That's I, I got to make up some motions or something to help them get it. But I, Holly goes, I don't know this one. I said, I don't know when I learned it, but I read it and then now it's stuck. And so anyways, you, now you know there's a song for verse 46. Verse 47, I'm glad Nathan knew it so I wasn't crazy. Actually, I'd have just taken credit and said, yeah, I made it up. But you said you knew it, so I can't do the Nash King. Uh, verse 47, it is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I like that, by the way. He didn't say he's going to give thanks to the Lord at church. He's going to give thanks to the Lord, to the Israelite people. He said, I'm going to give thanks to you in front of the heathen. Oh, well, it's easy to come to church, isn't it? Sing praises, say, I'm so glad God's blessed me. God's done so much. It's a different thing once you get out into like your job, into your uh, whatever, you're, you're with your family, out at Walmart. It's a little different, isn't it? But he said in front of the, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Verse 50, great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed evermore. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful once again to be in your house. I ask that you would bless this time together in your word. Help, this, uh, help us to finish off this Psalms. Uh, it's taken us five sermons to complete, but help us to finish it off on a high note. And Lord, I ask that you would help me to preach it. Empty me of self, then with the Holy Spirit. Uh, bring things to my mind, illustration, application that maybe I didn't think of before that may help. And uh, Lord, we just we, we want to hear from you, not me. We want to hear from you. So empty me of self, fill me with the Holy Spirit, get me out of the way, and you speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing.
I made you stand a little longer because I felt like singing. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And so we're going to keep working on that. By we, I mean my family. You probably won't sing it again. All right. Well, I've titled the message tonight, Sing It Out. Sing It Out. Music plays a huge part in the service, doesn't it? Yeah. I, just to give an example, uh, I, I heard, you know, one of the blessings of when I was gone on vacation was that Landon was able to play the piano and how nice it is to have a live piano playing. I mean, I, now don't get me wrong. I praise the Lord. I really do thank God that we were able to find these tracks. You know, we got them for free. We were able to play them. So we're able to have a tune to sing with, but nothing beats some live piano Amen. being played, does it? Uh, I, I found this story and I thought this is too great not to share. One Sunday, a particular church was supposed to make their giving commitments and it was for their building fund. They, so they had a special service and, and churches do that all the time. Uh, they'll usually have, and we do, I love my church Sunday. It's kind of similar to that. And so they were having one of those services and, and uh, they were going to try to commit a lot to building a new building. And so, you know, the, the pastor had been pushing it for for uh, really months and months, almost close to a year, and people have been saving and kind of excited for it. And the day came of the sun, that Sunday came, and the piano player fell sick. Oh, that kind of just, as a pastor, uh, that's a discouraging thing. But they had a backup piano player, and so the pastor takes the order of service to the backup piano player, and then says, hey, during the commitment time, because they were going to have an actual commitment time where people stood and committed to giving a certain amount, uh, and that can be exciting, especially in a really large church, uh, that when you have a lot of people standing, um, we're going to commit a thousand, we're going to commit five, whatever. And so uh, he, he asks the piano player, hey, during the commitment time, if you could find something to play, the piano player before you, the one that got sick, had kind of works this stuff out, uh, since she's not here, if you could do that for us. And so he goes through the service, the piano player does a great job through through the hymns and stuff, and even did a decent job with the choir special, even though it wasn't necessarily her strong suit, because choir specials are difficult, and she, she hum, hum, hem hawed through the special, and this choir special went okay, and then the pastor said, okay, it's time for our commitment time, he said, I would like everyone and anyone who is committing $1,000 to the building fund to please stand now, and right as he said that, the piano player began to play the Star Spangled Banners, and that's how that piano player became the permanent piano player. Some of y'all didn't get that when Star Spangled Banner plays, you stand, put your hand on your heart. Come on now. Uh -huh. I'm working. I'm, I need to put things on the lower shelf I can see tonight. <laughs> um, okay. A lot of this isn't going to make sense for some of you. Here we go. But anyway, so that, that piano player became the permanent piano player. And I thought that is just wonderful. All laughs aside, which there wasn't much because you didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> the music time of the service is where God becomes the audience. I say that a lot on Sunday mornings because that's the truth of it. The, 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 the times when we open the song books and Brother Frank gets up here and leads us, that is the time where God, it's the only time in the service where God is sitting back and just listening to us. It is his turn to be adored and worshiped and praised. Well, in our text tonight, verse 49 states, David states, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. David was stating that because of all that he has mentioned previously, which we don't have time to go back and talk about all four sermons we preached to get up to this point, so either you remember it or hopefully you'll go look it up on YouTube. I think most, if not all of them, are on there. And, and, and David had enumerated a lot of things that God had did for him, and it all kind of culminates with him saying, because of all that you did for, for me, Lord, I'm going to sing praises to you, even among the heathen. Not just at church, which by the way, we need to sing at church. Uh, I'll tell you, there's almost nothing more discouraging than like half-hearted, uninterested singing before you go to preach. I know that seems weird to you, but I've been in churches where I've sat and, 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 and uh, sometimes I get to preach where not just our church. I mean, obviously at our church, I see you every time. In fact, if you notice, I just try to focus on my songbook because it does frustrate me when people just ain't giving it 
what I think it should be given. So I just kind of focus on my own songbook and let God work on y'all's hearts. But it is discouraged. I've been at churches where I've got to preach and I, I could kind of see the auditorium as we sang songs. And I think to myself, well, I get to preach to all these joy birds right after this. Because <laughs> it's just dead and it's lifeless. So David here, in our text tonight, verses 46 through 50, he enumerates eight reasons. Eight reasons, not including what he already mentioned, but eight new reasons that he is going to praise God, thank Him, and sing praises to His name, even to the heathens. So tonight's message, we're going to go over those eight things. Isn't that encouraging? It's a, it's a one, two, three kind of practical sermon. So number one, we can praise God... Because he is alive. Look back at verse 46. He says, the Lord liveth. I can't think of a better reason to sing. No, I, I mean that completely seriously. You say, well, what about your salvation? That's great. My salvation doesn't happen if my Lord is not real. That's right. Amen. So can you understand why I'm saying I can't think of a better reason to sing that, that he is alive. Uh, not just Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that's a great reason, but that just simply that God actually exists. I hate wasting time. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. If you've ever worked with me, uh, me and my dad, I learned it from my dad, but he is a very strict rule. We do not double work. Do not double work. Whatever you have to do, if you've got to take a few minutes to think it out, to make sure you don't do things more than once. Do the job, and, and his thing was when, we'd hand, when, he, when he owned the bread route, every time you handle the bread is a waste of time. One time is all you should have to handle it. It goes on the shelf. Anytime you have to move it after that, you're just wasting your own time. I hate, and because I worked with my dad, he's instilled it in me. I don't like to double work. I don't like to waste time. I hate it. And whenever I think of people praying to Mary, the first thought that comes to my mind is, what a waste of time. No, I... I understand their heart that may, might be in the right place. It might just be that they've uh, been led astray by false doctrine. I understand all of that, but my heart... I see people rubbing a Buddha belly or whatever, or praying to some statue of some saint whatever from some time ago that they think is somebody special. And I look at that and I, the first thought is usually, what a waste of time. Don't they realize that that picture, that statue, that Buddha, that incense, that candle, whatever it is, is not going to do a thing for them because it's not alive. It's not real. David said, man, I'm going to sing praises to God, number one, because He is alive. The Lord liveth. He's made it evident that He is alive. I'm so glad that I, I was even talking to Brother Jeff Copes on the phone. Brother Nathan knows who that is. Uh, he's the, uh, uh, really he's the finance guy of Heartland Baptist Bible College, but they gave him the title of Executive Vice President, whatever that means. There's a president, there's the vice president, and there's an executive vice president, whatever that means. Anyways, I was talking to him on the phone, and he was making sure every I got what I needed to know about interns, and he asked me how the church was going. I said, I said, man, God's been good, and I, and I said, I'm gonna just take a minute to just enumerate the miracles that we've seen God do. We had some of those this year. We we've seen God do some literal miracles that have been on our prayer sheet that we're going that 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 if you ask man, you'd probably say that's probably impossible. It doesn't seem likely. And, and we had some miracles because our God is alive. Amen. And David said, that's a good reason to sing. It's a good reason to sing. It's not a waste of time because he's alive. So first, we can praise him because he's alive. Number two, we can praise him because the Lord is our rock. Back in verse 46. And blessed be my rock. The word rock was a, a refuge, a place to go when you are in danger. So that's what a refuge, a rock, would, would signify. Uh, typically what they were talking about when they mentioned a rock was actually the cleft of a rock that they could kind of hide in for protection from danger. And so David was saying there, the Lord is my protection. He's the place I can go when I'm in danger. He's the place that I can go when I'm afraid. And I'm a man. I don't like to admit that I'm ever afraid or I'm ever scared. But there's times when I'm scared. I, I, won't, uh, I won't go in all into it again, but I remember the day Brody was born that night, that morning, whatever time it was, I've already forgotten. I just know it was late at night or early in the morning. I remember being scared because he wasn't breathing. I was in fear. I was terrified. And when you're scared, the Lord's your rock. The Lord is the place you can hide. You say, well, I'm not ever scared. Well, then you're a fool. Yeah. I, I, I'm terrified. Uh, 
at the way that, you know, Satan's going to attack my family. So why? Because I've preached on family a lot. And it seems like when I preach on family, Satan goes, goes ahead and gives an extra dose of pressure to my family. I'm scared of the way that Satan's going to tempt my children in the future. I'm scared of the way that this world is, is turning and the way and the, the world that my kids have to grow up in. I, I'm a grown man. I've made my decisions and I'm probably already at 29 years old, too stubborn to change anyway. But my kids, they have to grow up here too. I'm scared of what's going to, I, I fear a lot of things. And David said, and when I was afraid, when I was in, when I was in fear, when my life was at stake, when I needed a place to go, God was always my rock. When you can't trust your spouse, you can trust God. Well, that's dark. I know, it's, but your spouse is a person too that is sinful too. When you can't trust your parents or your kids, some of y'all, more y'all are in the kid department than parents. I still think of my parents because I'm still young. You can trust God. When you can't trust your government. Yeah. By the way, if you trust your government, we need to have a conversation. <laughs> Was it Ronald Reagan that said some of the scariest words you'll ever hear is we're the government and we're here to help? Yes. I think it was Ronald Reagan that said that. We're the government and we're here to help? That's bad. <laughs> when you can't trust your government, you can trust God. Amen. When we sing hymns that speak of all that God does for us, you should sing it out because he has been the only place of refu refuge for you and for me. And before you try to give credit to well, I mean... You could say God was my refuge, but really it was my parents that really helped me out of that situation. Really it was this person that helped me. It was my job that helped me out of that situation. We can go back to last week's sermon. Every single good thing that's ever happened to you, from your physical to your mental to your spiritual, it is all thanks to God. Yeah. Don't forget to give credit where credit is due. So number one, we can praise him because he's alive. Number two, he is our rock. Number three, we can praise the Lord because he is our salvation. Verse 46 says, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Now I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Before you say something, I already know David was talking physically. He was. When he was talking about his salvation, God had delivered him. That's what salvation means, is deliverance. God had delivered him from the hand of Saul and his enemies, and he was praising. But that the re direct application to that verse to us is God has delivered us from our ultimate enemy, which is our own sin, ourselves. It kind of seems obvious that we ought to sing praises to God because he saved us. Amen. Uh, we ought to be willing to lift it up. He forgave you of your sins. He gave you victory over your sins. He gave you freedom from your sins. He made you a new creature. He has given you an eternity in His presence instead of an eternity separated from Him. And when we sing songs that directly correlate to my salvation, to our salvation, that ought to be a time where we're really belted out. And if you're not belting it out, when you start singing about your own salvation, I'd ask you if you really actually ever got it. I think of a song like, just this one just popped in my head. I'm going to take it as God. When we all get to heaven, what that means is I'm saved, I get to go. We ought to sing that one pretty peppy, huh? Amen. I know this world's dark, this world kind of stinks. I, if I'm honest, I'm bl we're blessed that we live in America, but when we read missionary letters about China, and we read uh, missionary letters about Brazil, and we read missionary letters about Japan and about Nepal, I go, man, this world's terrible. No, America's still all right. We're doing okay, and I know we got our problems, but you'll, you won't. You, I am yet, I'm not yet ready to say America stinks. Why? Because I'm still standing here preaching today without any fear. Nobody's locked me in on the, on the interstate. Nobody's taken away any of my freedoms. I still got all my guns. Amen. America is still doing pretty good right now. In my opinion, you can argue with me afterwards about that. But this world's not that great. And when we get to sing about when we all get to heaven... Because I'm saved, I get to go. It ought to, it ought to, oh man, when I look out and we're singing, and I, like I said, I, shame on me. You guys have, you guys and just church in general, most people in general have beat me into this form of just focus on my songbook or look up to God when I'm singing. Because if I look out, I just get frustrated. Because how do you sing when we all get to heaven? Like, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Yes, I did it out of tune too, because most of the time they are. <laughs> I'd wonder, did they ever even experience it? 
Did they not realize what that is? What salvation is? <sighs> We're going to preach on salvation Sunday morning. Of course, we do most Sunday mornings, but I mean, it's a, it's a straight gospel message. Here's the title. The gospel. I know it's real difficult. That's the title. So you ought to, I'm, I'm already kind of charged up about that. No, next, uh, number four. We can praise the Lord because he is our avenger. He says in verse 47, It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. Now many of us actually don't think that this is very great. Mainly because our flesh wants revenge for ourselves. Um, I'll give you a story of a missionary. Uh, I might have said this story before. I never met this man, but I've been told by preachers who did know him. If there was a missionary that was as close to Paul as you could ever get, this was the guy. And uh, this missionary, his wife was... Uh, somebody broke into his house, beat him up, stole his stuff, and uh, assaulted his wife. I'll just say it that way. And he prayed that God would allow him to get to witness to those men. I can't. I'm not there spiritually yet. Somebody hurts my family, I want to hurt them. It is in my very flesh. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm not enough like Jesus. I want revenge. I want to do something to them. They hurt my family. I want back. David said, he's my avenger. So while our flesh may not like this very much, we can rejoice in our spirit that God does kind of, he notices. He, he is willing to stand up and take revenge for anyone that is going to hurt us or our family. I don't have to get at people who try to hurt me or my family or my church. God is my avenger. And just like David, when God handles it, it all works out a lot better. If I'm being honest with you, if somebody hurts my family and I go hurt them, i probably go to prison. Now, I'll, I'll plead insanity because I might be insane at that moment. I may not have clear thinking, but I might still go to prison. Well, there's some problems with that. This church all of a sudden lost its pastor because I went and shot somebody or stabbed somebody or beat the snot out of somebody for doing something. Um, my family just lost the, the breadwinner, the husband. My kids just lost their father. There's a lot of downside when I take things into my own hands, isn't there? But when God handles it, there's no downside for him. David found that out. He could have killed Saul. He had his opportunities. We've talked about this at length through, verse, or through chapter 17. He had every chance in the world to take his revenge for somebody who, without cause, tried to take his life. He didn't, and God worked it all out. I mean, the, king, the kingdom just fell right under his command. It went just as, as smooth as it could have been because God handled the situation. So number four, we can praise uh, God because he's our avenger. And now number five. Let me turn the page. Should have done that earlier. We can praise because God delivers us from our enemy. Verse 48. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. God can avenge us. As we, the last point, God can avenge us from those that do hurt us, but he can also protect us from those who want to hurt us. Praise the Lord. Uh, that, I know we automatically think of people. Now, generally speaking, because of the society that we live in, because of the government we have, uh, most people don't necessarily want harm for other people. I may not like somebody, you may not like somebody, but most of the time we're not trying to physically hurt them. Mainly because of, again, our governmental system. You go to certain places and you find out, uh, okay, I'll just say it. I don't care. I know this is going on in the world, right? You go to certain de Democratic-ran uh, states and you find out that some of that isn't as serious, that, that people will just randomly run over to old women and punch them right in the face. You say, why? Well, I blame the government on that because it doesn't seem to happen in states where they're actually people will go and steal things and get away with it. Anyways, okay, I'm getting off topic, but... We always usually think of people, but did you know there's more than just people that want to hurt us? There's, there's other enemies. Now, you might automatically start to think, uh, of course, there's the devil. Yes, there is Satan. And, and by the way, like I said earlier, I'm still fearful of what the devil's going to do uh, to me, to my family, to my kids, what he's going to try to do, how he's going to try to affect us, how he's going to try to tear us apart. He's a very real enemy. Uh, but there's a lot of it. Our government can be our enemy. That's right. By the way, that's why the Second Amendment is important. Amen. It's not for hunting. I know they always, why do, you, why do you need 15 guns, 20 guns to go, what do you need an AR-15 to go hunting for? I don't need an AR-15 for hunting. I need an AR-15. If the government shows up with an AR-15, I want one too to combat their AR-15. That's right. 
that's what that's about, by the way. I know I'm helping some of y'all out. <laughs> really, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's okay. Um, maybe somebody that isn't as enlightened will listen to this on YouTube and understand it. But our government can be our enemy. A court system, we found out, can be an enemy. Or child, child protectors can be an enemy. Uh, our, our flesh can be our enemy. We have a lot of enemies. And God can protect us from every single one of them. Your boss can be your enemy. Your boss can want the worst for you and it not work. You say, well, if my boss wants, has, has it out for me, it's going to work because he's my boss. Not always. Typically, there's always somebody above that one. Now, if you make the, the one at the very top mad, I'm going to say that was your fault. Uh, but typically, there's always somebody above that boss that, that God... If he can control the heart of a king, as the Bible says, and turn it with us wherever he goes, I'm pretty sure he can turn the heart of a judge or a boss or a family member who wants something bad to happen to you. He can do that because he can protect us from our enemies. He can deliver us from them all because he is God and he is all powerful and he can handle any enemy we face, even the ones that we struggle with. So number six, it goes a lot with number five. We can praise God because He delivers us from our own violent emotions. Our own violent emotions. You say, hang on, brother, I didn't see that in the text. Well, look back with me. I didn't see it the first time either. It took me some study. I love the way, by the way, I, I, I encourage people to read the Bible, and, and that's important. But sometimes you read, if something doesn't make sense, you might try to figure out what it means. Uh, because sometimes the meanings are cool. And so back to verse number 48. We'll read the whole thing. It says, He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up from those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Singular. Violent man. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, that's obviously Saul. Well, Saul kind of falls under the category of enemies. I believe, and, and as best as I could understand from study, the violent man is David. I've said this before. We all say it to ourselves. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. I, I just mentioned a minute ago how I would love to be my own avenger sometimes or my family's avenger and get my own revenge because that's the, uh, can I say it like this? That's the violent man. You know what David's referencing there? It's not actually an enemy at that point. He's referencing the violent man of himself. God protected him from doing the stupid things, I know my wife hates when I say that, she's getting so mad, my kids have picked up stupid. <laughs> it's my fault. My, my ki uh, anyways, God protected David from doing something stupid. You can't tell me that in his flesh, David wasn't angry enough to want to take Saul's life, to slit his throat. Proof of that is he took a piece of his garment just to make himself feel good. Because man, did he want it bad. But that was the violent man. That was his emotions telling him, get revenge, get it. Do what you've got to do to, take, to, to get, the, get ahead here in life. And David's saying, I'm so glad God protected me from my own violent emotions. Mm -hmm. People are naturally violent. Uh, we, we already referenced Democratic run cities and stuff. Um, tell me what in the world makes sense about running up and punching somebody in the face just randomly on the street somebody you don't know have no why why go up into a place and shoot it up for no reason why do that because men in their natural flesh are violent i'm not just meaning men i mean all mankind naturally is violent our thoughts are violent our emotions are violent we turn to violence you don't believe me come hang out with my two-year-old he is a mean little snob <laughs> Why? Because he is, he's a, he's a human. He's a man, a, a little man, but he's a man nonetheless. And he's violent. And he's, the other day, he, he had to get some for it, but he shook his fist at Holly and said, Don't you call me. Because she told him to come here. And he poked his head up. Don't you call me. You say, how is that possible? Because he's got a violent man inside of him. And David here was referencing, God, thank you for giving me control over that violent emotion inside of me that wanted to get revenge. That I, I imagine in my head when David threw that spear and it hit the wall, or as Saul threw that spear and it hit the walls, David was playing that harp. In my mind, David had every inkling in his heart to grab that spear and throw it right back. Say, so why? Because he had a violent man inside him that we all have inside of us. And we like to use excuses too. Well, I, you've heard them. I'm just an angry person. Or I have a hard time controlling what I say. Mm -hmm. David could have easily used any of those excuses. In fact, he could have justly said, he, he tried to kill me first. Mm -hmm. 
but he didn't because God delivers us from the violent emotions that lost people are subject to. By the way, the world is subject to them. The people that do those violent things, it makes no sense to me, except for the fact that I understand that men are inherently evil, wicked, violent people. Number seven. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. I'm glad we had a little extra time because I was like, man, I'm going to have to hurry. I'm not going to be able to do anything other than what I have on my paper. And it's going to be snowing real hard, but snow hasn't even started yet. So, oh, praise the Lord. Here we go. Number seven, we can praise God because he's merciful. Look at verse number 50. It says, great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed David, of course, was reflecting on God's mercy for himself. Also, I do believe that there's a little bit. Don't forget that. And, and I could do this in every message. I could do this in every message, but I don't want it to get repetitive. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it'd be good if I do it. David is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. I don't have all the time in the world to go into how David's a type of Christ. But um, read verse 50 and think of Jesus for a minute. Great deliverance giveth he to his king. Like what? I don't know. Like delivering Jesus from death. And showeth mercy to his anointed. Now, of course, it applies to David, but because David is a picture of Christ, you can apply a lot of what David says. In fact, I'm, do, I'm going to do some of that on Sunday morning when we go through the gospel. And anyways, so David, of course, was referencing himself. God had showed him great mercy. God had delivered him. He was his anointed. We already know that, that Samuel had anointed him as the next king. He was God's anointed, and he was thanking God for his mercy. But can't we all sit back and reflect on God's mercy for us, Amen. to us, in our lives? I made a list. <laughs> I realize I didn't deserve salvation, number one. I didn't deserve that. It's, not, it's grace, but it's mercy. Mercy is the only reason that I'm saved. It's God's mercy. I know I got saved as a teenager. I grew up in church. I lived a pretty good life. As you heard on Sunday, I've never touched alcohol, never touched drugs, never touched tobacco, never messed with any of that stuff, um, never went to a party, didn't go to prom, none of that stuff. And yet I was still a wicked sinner that didn't deserve God's mercy in my life. I realized I don't deserve to pastor. That's just the mercy of God. No, no, I don't deserve it. I may be ordained for it. I may have gone to school for it. But that doesn't mean I deserve to stand here. Nobody, I don't think anybody rightfully deserves to get to proclaim God's word. It is only by mercy that I get to proclaim God's word to anybody at any point in time. Amen. I realize I don't deserve my wife. Why did, why did God decide to give me Miss Holly? Don't know. I ask myself that question a lot, actually, because uh, she's much better than I. But I didn't deserve her. I don't deserve to have my children. Oh, well, that's just what happens when uh, two people get married and love each other. And they, that's not always what happens. I have a pastor friend in Roswell, New Mexico. His name's David Walden. Him and his wife can't have kids. They've been married a uh, little less time than Holly and I have. And they've been trying to have kids pretty much from the beginning. Can't have kids. I don't deserve to have kids. Why did God decide to let me have kids? That's God's mercy. I didn't deserve to have two parents. In, this, in our society, that's pretty major. Now, I know my, and some of you know, my parents got divorced before, I, or uh, it was right after I was born or whatever. I, I, my parents, my, my, my bio dad, biological dad divorced my mom, uh, but she started dating who is now my adopted dad, my stepdad, whatever you want to call him, my dad. She started dating him when I was six months old. Six months old. I don't know any different. All my life, I have mom and dad. I didn't deserve that. I know a lot of people, good people, that didn't have that. Why did I get that? That was God's mercy. I didn't deserve to have grandparents, by the way, grandparents on the side of my adopted dad that cared enough to take me to church every Sunday. They had to go backwards. They had to drive away from church, pick me up, take us to church, and then go past their house again to drop us off. Typically, they took us out to lunch too, which they also didn't have to do. But some of my favorite memories are going to Quan Din Chinese restaurant with my grandparents and because my parents never took us to buffets and getting to eat buffet. I didn't deserve to have those grandparents. I didn't do anything special. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have some special gift or it was God's mercy. Amen. I didn't deserve, and, I, and, and I, I was thinking about it as I was writing this, I didn't deserve to live in a place that always had a solid Baptist church in it. Yeah. Every place I've ever lived, from birth to now, from, from, from Roswell, New Mexico, to Carlsbad, New Mexico, to Oklahoma City, to... Artesian, New Mexico, 
to Florissant, Colorado, which is somewhere between lost and nowhere, God's always put, put me in a place that has a good, solid Baptist church. Yeah. Not everybody can say that. That's a blessing. That's mercy that I don't deserve. I didn't deserve to be born in America. No, I know. we proud to be an American. Don't get me wrong. Proud is, is all get out. But I realize that every day there's a certain amount of babies that are made, conceived. Why did I happen to be one that was conceived by two people that lived in America? I don't know. And I, I could have been conceived in Nepal. I could have been conceived in China. And, and, and then all those other things that I mentioned probably aren't happening. But God has just been so merciful to say, there's a 17% chance that you get to be born in America. And Stephen, you get to be one of them. That's mercy. Amen. Everything that I love and enjoy are because God is merciful to me. And that should cause some singing, shouldn't it? And I think we could all sit back and reflect pretty much similar to how I just did. I just have the mic so I get to do it in front of everybody. But that ought to cause us to sing, shouldn't it? Yeah. And lastly, number eight, we can praise God because he keeps his word. Look back at verse 50. He says, Great deliverance give he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed. This is what I want to focus on to David and to his seed evermore. Now you might say, what does that have to do with God keeping his word? Well, you see, in David's life, he told him that he was going to go ahead and let David ret retain, in David's lineage, to retain the throne of David. Knowing full and well that David's own son wasn't going to be worthy to stay king. Solomon very quickly went wicked, even though David was his dad. And Rehoboam was wicked. You say, why did God allow them? And, and, and I don't have time to give the whole history of Israel, but if you notice, uh, it went from David and then to uh, Solomon, who was wicked. And then after Solomon, it split. But God always, and if you read the Bible, if you go through Judges, if you go through the Kings and the Chronicles, you'll, you'll see this phrase a lot. Because of my servant David. Because of what I said to my servant David, because God had made a promise to David, the, the, the throne continued. And if you read the genealogies, one thing that I know, genealogies are the most boring thing in the world. It's what everybody thinks. And, and, and I preach them for a reason. Every time I come across a genealogy, I give it my very best because God wouldn't put it there for no reason. Names are important. I'm glad my name's in the land book of life in heaven. Names are important. And so and we get to those genealogies and we can follow how David's lineage led right to Jesus Christ. And guess what? One day, Jesus Christ, he too is going to sit on that same throne of David. Maybe not the exact same throne, but on the throne of David there in Jerusalem and rule and reign over all of us. You say, how's all that going to happen? Well, it's all going to happen because God said it would and God keeps his word. It's pretty reassuring. It's pretty encouraging. My salvation is secure because God said it is. I don't worry about it. I'm saved and I don't stress about it. I don't think about it. I don't, I, 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 I've talked about a Nazarene friend I had in high school a lot that he was afraid he could lose his salvation. So he was afraid at any point in time if he died and he wasn't all repented up and all straight with God, then he'd go to hell. It's a terrifying way to live. But God says, I've got you in my hand and no man will pluck it out. And I'm secure. My life is orchestrated by God. He said it is. He's sovereign. He's providential. So everything that happens in my life, whether good or bad, well, by the way, I've said it before. I've said it through this chapter 18. We go through some bad. In fact, that was the second message. What are you going to do when trouble comes? David determined when trouble comes, I'm going to turn to the Lord. What are you going to do when trouble comes? When the trouble comes, I can trust God's orchestrating it. I may not like it. I may not enjoy it. I may not want it to continue. But I understand God orchestrated it because he said it is. And all things work to, to good, to them that love God, to them that are called according to their purpose. So even in the bad, I know it's working out for my good and for his glory. Because God said it is. I know nothing I'll do will ever go without a reward. We just talked about that on Sunday. I know because God said it would. I don't mind mowing the yard. Well, you shouldn't have to. Okay, I don't mind doing it. I know it's not a waste of my time. Because God sees what I'm doing. He knows what, I, what I'm attempting to do. His word is sure. David said, man, that gives me a reason to sing. There, 
David enumerated eight reasons why he would praise God and sing praises unto the Lord, including in front of the heathen. So I ask you, which one of those eight aren't true for you? Now, I'm hoping you don't argue and say, well, number three, yeah, I don't think that one was quite for me. No, they're, they're all true for all of us. Everything that David enumerated that he could praise God for right there at the end of, verse, of chapter uh, 18, we can say those same things. In fact, I pretty much did. As long as we're saved, by the way. That is kind of a prerequisite there. So then if, if you had to grade your own praise to God, how are you doing? Not just at church, but yeah, let's, let's, let's talk church first. How's your praise to God here at church? I mean, is, it, is song service a time that you grab your songbook and you, and you turn to the pages and you focus and you're reading the words and you're singing them out and you're trying to sing to your butt? Well, I don't have a good voice. God didn't say sing with a good voice. David didn't even say sing with a good voice. He said make a joyful noise. Now, by the way, a joyful noise helps if you have a smile on your face. That's just, uh, just going to help you out with that. Or is the song service a time for you to talk, to cut up, to, to text, to do this, to do that? I, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm not thinking of anybody. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But I, I think this a lot. We shouldn't have to sing people up on Sunday afternoons. My eyes are still closed, so I don't look at anybody. It shouldn't be that I tell Brother Frank, yeah, let's go ahead and start. Let's sing them up. Well, why not? Because the song service is so important. And if singing praises to God meant as much to us as it did to David, none of us would be late for that. We would all be up here before the time that we're supposed to start, songbook in hand, ready to go as soon as it happened. Amen. But also, how do you sing? How are you about singing praises everywhere else? I just mentioned I'm trying to teach my kids verse 46 during family devotion time. Yeah, nobody else around. Nobody else is going to pat me on the back or give a hand. I'm just trying to teach my kids, praise the Lord here at home. Uh, I listen to sermons mostly, but I do enjoy um, in the minivan with the family. A lot of what we do is, yes, they watch movies sometimes, but we practice whatever song we're going to sing here at church, Izzy and I do. So there we are in the car, singing, preacher, tell me like it is, to nobody. Well, to God, but there's nobody around. How are you at singing praises to God at work? At family functions, when it's appropriate. I'm not saying you just be a weirdo that's always just, ah, the Lord liveth and blessed be my... I'm not saying be weird about it, but when you got a moment, there ought to be a song in your heart because of what God's done for you. I have this in my notes, so I'll say it. I'd rather you mess around through preaching. Now, I'd rather you not mess around at all. But if you're going to be messing around during something, I'd, I'd rather you mess around through the preaching. Because there's only one time when God is the audience. God speaks to us all the time. Through his word, through preaching. But we don't have very many times we set aside to actually sing praises to God. So when we do have those times, man, I think it ought to be something that we give our all to. Now again, I'd say I'd rather you not do it ever. <laughs> uh, but, so, here's where my title came from. From now on, because of how good God is to us, because of his mercy, because he's avenging us, because he protects us, because he's our rock, because he's alive, because, because all the other eights, because of all of that, let's sing it out. Amen. Here at church, at home, in the car. I like to whistle, so I'll whistle songs sometimes. I think God might still get some praise from that if it's done with it. It's a joyful noise, is it not? You can argue with me about it, but I'm, I'm probably going to win. Because you're wrong. It's a joyful noise. Amen. Yeah. I'm just saying, God, and I think what David was trying to say is, I'm going to sing even to the heathen. I don't care who hears it. Because God's been so good to me. And I just, I look at that and say, well, God's been so good to all of us. Why, why don't we all have that mentality? Why shouldn't we all sing with that kind of heart? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to sing it out. As I, I, I worked on this message and I felt like it was practical, but Lord, I was convicted all the way through it. How often my mind can be on the message or, or this or that, even during the song service. And I, I, I apologize for that, Lord. You deserve so much more of my attention. 
You deserve it all when it's time to sing praises to you. You deserve me singing praise to you at all throughout the day, alone. It doesn't matter when, why I clean. It doesn't matter. You deserve that praise. So help us all to sing it out, considering all that you've done for us. So thankful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.